Guys and girls, thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. I, I love this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, about another two years, if I keep mucking around, I'll be able to brag that I've been doing this for 60 years. Solid. Hey, good it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. Clearly doesn't like it. <laughs> so uh, I started when I was 14 and I'm 72. So two more years I'll be 74 and that'll be it. When we've got this tail, it goes, can you see how the spine goes straight? And then come in close and see, and then suddenly the tail veers to another direction. That corner there, that's the most important joint for a butcher because this separates the rump from the T-bone. So if I go down here, I actually will have one of the pork shops still attached, okay? So let's just play games with this. I'm going to cut across from there. I'm gonna cut straight onto that joint. And because the hip, the hip is at such an angle, I've had to go on a slight angle to get around the hip joint. Can you see how it was difficult? I had the joint, but the hip bone was on that angle. All right, so we've taken that off, and what, we've, what we're left with is a rough looking Tiva, which is that's the nature of the beast. A lot of people order pork chops from the butcher. Oh, but I order them all one size. You can have them all the same weight practically, but you can't have them all the same shape. <laughs> because over here there's a lot of fillet. As the fillet diminishes, it gets smaller, so they're all going to be different. And one of the big jobs you've got is not to send out a little pork chop and a big pork chop to two guys on the side. Sick of being the guy that gets the small <laughs> pork chop and the guy next to me's got a big one. Give us both small ones. All right? Okay, so now we're going to separate. These are the three main parts. We're going to separate the shoulder from the loin. And if I can, I go one, two, three, four. Five is standard. If you're desperate to have an extra rib on your rack, you can cheat and go four. That way there's an extra rib staying on your rack because you might have a certain number of guests and you want that extra chop. Okay? By doing that, then we've got, so that's five, got two, four, six, eight, it's nine. There's a floater there that's not always there. So, as you know, an eight rib lamb rack is just perfection. Here you've got eight to nine ribs, but if we wanted to, we could turn it into a ten. All right, which I think I'm going to do. I'm going to go one, two, three, four. I'll go between the ribs. And the most important thing for me to remember is that the ribs are on an angle. There's none of the straight lines business. So, Every one of these joints is a cartilage, that's a rib. So when I want to cut between the fourth rib and the fifth rib, I've got to cut halfway through. Halfway through there. And now that is totally free. Voila. Nice, eh? And it's just hit the cartilage on the blade bone. Okay? When it's on the fifth rib, you don't see that. Now you can understand why the industry would cut it on the fifth rib and then leave the over here completely. But when you trim a rack, you get rid of a fair bit of the outside most of the time and uh, you're after that. The only thing we can't do today is to get rid of the chine 
C-H-I-N-E, chine bone, and these feather bones. The reason they're called feathers because they stick like that, they're cut in half, and they just look like little feathers. We can't do that because we haven't got a bandsaw. So if we had a bandsaw, we could really attack it well, but we're going to be turning these into chops after I turn it into a rack. Now, because the the last rib, see, I've actually got one and a half ribs over here. There's a half a rib floater. So now we've got two, four, six, eight, nine, and that little tiny one. So we're going to go back to that little tiny one because it's too short and we're going to cut through and we're going to cut across at a slight angle. So now this way we have got all the rack and now the short line which makes up T-bone, yes? Isn't it nice when you when you can refer to something like a T-bone to give you an idea of what the hell it is. You know? Short line pork chops isn't always to go. So that breaks at that cartilage joint. And there it is. Minimal fat. Not the sort of not the sort of pig that I like. Because fat is flavour. And you also got a chance to take the skin off and leave a bit of fat on. But here there's nothing but in some of the bigger pigs, the fat can be that thick. On the really large pigs, we've got fat that's this thick. And it gets all separated in slabs and hung up to dry in Italy like prosciutto. And instead of you having bread and butter, you have lardo with bread, crusty bread that might have been toasted with a hint of garlic, hint of rosemary top. <laughs> And that, and that pig fat that's been aged for a couple of months is just heaven. <laughs> so there's the pork chops. Now, when they bone out the big pigs, it's because they're chasing the pork strip loin, which is very important in the industry these days. But that releases all these ribs as American spare ribs. But because the pig is too small, we don't want to turn it into a, 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 a sirloin. We want to leave it as a rack or chops. So that means that we end up carving it off like this and the only ribs we're going to have are the ones on the belly. So these ribs here that aren't coming out today but would in a much larger pig, that's called the baby back ribs. You all know baby <laughs> back ribs. But over here, these are the St. Louis ribs. Have you heard of St. Louis ribs? So baby back, everyone's heard of. <clears throat> but these fr front ribs, they're a triangular shape of the same bone structure that that is. These are all hard bone. Again, they've got the little curve and they're just gorgeous. These are flat and they're big there and they keep getting smaller. While here, the, the white cartilage bones that are attached to them, they're bigger and they get smaller as it goes. So it's like two triangles side by side. And again, delicious, but more fiddly. But some people just can't eat those because they want to chew on these white bones. Okay, so let's just cut off these ribs. And when you're working as a butcher, so on a band so it just goes done. When I'm working like this, I might need one of you in a second if, if this is unstable to hold that part for me. Yep. All right, so I'm just, <laughs> gonna, I'm just gonna go and see how it goes. It's, it's the gig, so you lean across. Lean across and just hold that for me. And what we've got is we've got a saw that's uh, not cooperating because it's not, it's not sharp enough. So we're gonna oh, get... <laughs> We're going to use that in a minute. You need to be You got my hat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. you just did that. It was pretty. So. Boy, I'm going to clean up. 
Let's have a look at this. Now, that's a pork belly. You know what to do with that. But when we take off the St. Louis ribs, this is what we have to do. We just slide the bone of the knife over the ribs and we lift it up past where the ribs are to where all these soft, soft bones are. So, beautiful St. Louis ribs. I presume that you all know that that thing I was talking about. I need a thing. I just need a cloth uh, so that I can use, use that. That's it. Instead of. Uh, so, whenever you try to rip this off, it's better with a paper towel or a cloth because it's, you just get good grip. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, and you see, you see how quickly that, that lifts off. Yes. Now, what happens here is, these membranes, when they're off bigger pigs, they become wrapping material for salamis and other things that we want to air dry. So nothing is wasted, no. Eh? But I prefer that back on there so it becomes juicier with more ribs. Some of them lift off these bits of meat because they think they're ugly. Jesus Christ, what's this got to do with looks when you want to eat something that's beautiful? Now, this is our rack. If we remove the chine and these feathers, then we would have only the ribs to be able to go through. If we took off two fingers of meat on here, we'd expose these bones. So let's just do that, because we're not going to upset anybody by not doing the perfect pork chops. But I'll cut right down there. And then, and this could be treated just like a mini pork belly. Yes? Yes, please. <laughs> Absolutely. So when it comes to this, the next step for the average butcher is to just go between the ribs and he will remove these rib fingers. Again, you know, you could just about cheat and eat all these and your boss won't even know because <laughs> he won't remember they were supposed to be there. So rib fingers in the old days were just a cheap meal for one of the staff. But now, because everybody knows how good they are, they're always chasing it, but I won't do any more. The reason I won't do any more, I want to show you something. This is butcher shop quality. But when you guys have got to do competition, okay, and this works with, with the pork, with beef, with lamb, Cut down to the bone. Now, depend on how, how clean my nails are, because I, I'm really fussy about cleanliness. I'm just peeling back. Can you see what I just did? Can you see what I just did? Okay, make sense? Yeah. Okay. Technically, it's easy once you learn how, but it's also so much harder. And it's not as simple as what I just did. Because for the rest of the rib, this bloody shit is bloody attached <laughs> to the bone. So always with a nice cloth, and you start to fight it. The younger the pig is, the easier this stuff is to do. 
As it gets older, that meat will attach to those ribs. Then you will have to fight it. So whenever you get that, whenever you're fighting, then the only option you've got is to scrape. Yeah. So you've learned the scrape method, I presume. All right, it's not 100% as nice, but eventually, I'd say I don't even want to do it. But you understand, <laughs> don't you? All right, just keep going. It'll never be as nice as that. But it'll be better than this when you scrape it. All right, so I hope that uh, you end up having fun. I've been, I've been waiting for this class for like the last two and a half years. <laughs> All right. Now, the other thing that I, I like to say is that sometimes if you're blasting at high temperatures, you burn these. You wrap it up. So wrap it up with a bit of alfoil. I try to put a little tiny bit of baking paper over it, and then alfoil. Because yep. the number of times that the alfoil sticks, oh. and then you've got another problem, <laughs> you're about to play it up and you've got to get rid of the silver foil and it's dried on hard. So when you're trying to avoid problems in your life, a little bit of baking paper, then the old foil. If I was doing this as a rack, either skin on or skin off, this little bit of bone here I would just run, because remember that's the little bit of blade that we talked about. I would just run my knife in there and I would try to remove it so it now no longer exists. And the only problem I've got is the first pork chop is gonna break down to a couple of pieces. But how could you knock back that even if it was <laughs> broken down a couple of pieces? doesn't matter to me. All right? So I'm gonna chop these later. I don't wanna do it now. Because then I'm gonna chop these, which is prime evil. Remember, we, that's all we ever used a uh, 100 years ago and up to 50 years ago. <laughs> When the bandsaw came in, all these little chips of bone that could get stuck in your teeth and really cause grief. Let's just do something here. <laughs> Thank you. Female. Female. Female pork. Okay. And you say, how can you tell? How can you tell? Well, of course, when you've got the experience, it's just easy as hell. God has been good to us this morning because he's actually created this little white patch. Now why is that little white patch there? Because both legs were together there. They weren't touching here, but here they were touching. But that's still pork rind. Okay? You can just see that's the fat and that's the rind. So this is white only because the two cheeks <laughs> are touching. <laughs> but this is our guide to what's male and what's female. If this was male, right here next to the tail at the back side of the crutch bone, there would be a little round muscle that would be just some common, about a bit bigger than uh, the head of a texter. Okay, the head of a texter. And in the center of that little round muscle is a darker little circle like a bullseye. And that's the, the remnants of the male penis, which is, starts here, comes out and goes all the way up here before it comes out to do its business over here. And it's hiding inside the body. But it starts off here. And when they remove it, the remnant is there. So as a butcher, I just, yeah, yeah, that's a male. Right, but for you guys, you've got to go over, you've got to inspect it, you've got to touch it, you've got to feel it. You do that on your wedding night. <laughs> okay? So, the other thing that's a dead giveaway is that there's this perfect arc. That's female. Remember, there's a correlation between this and chicken thighs. Because that's exactly the same thing. You've got that little round bone and thinner cup. All right, so here we go. And whenever we're boning, wherever this knife is going, is you've got to be sure that 
So if I was working up here, I'd have to be very careful if the knife slip is going to get my hand. So just conscious always. And the blunter the knife, the more pressure you've got on it, the more chance of a slip and a cut. A sharp knife, so light, you never really lose control of it. So be careful. And this is an ugly bone in shape, so it's very awkward to get around. There's so much meat on it, and they'd sit there just sucking away at those bones in heaven. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so this is the shape of a prosciutto. The longer we were to trim that off and round this out, that would be just like a whole prosciutto bone in. Okay? We wouldn't have all this bone out if we did a hand. We'd leave only, we'd leave, take the tail off, but leave the rest of the bone in for a cooked ham, all right? Now here is the knee. Okay. It was a knee. All right, so it takes nothing to take off the shank, which in German cooking is one of the great, this is the, the hindquarter shank, the front shank, is delicious too, but it's not as pretty. And this one here can stand up. If we left more meat on it, it'd be just like a German knuckle. And then we could chop off that. So it would have be like a little mountain. And all that crackle on the outside, all that stuff. Like me, you like me a pork knuckle. All right. Then because we know, we know where the bone is from the knee to the joint, we just go like that. Now I don't want to be as clean with my bone work as I try to be here because all that skin that's attached to the bone, I don't want it in my dish. So don't ever try to be, because this bone, I can turn that into pure cleanliness. But then I've got extra gristle inside my curry or stew or whatever it is that I was going to do. And I can use the weight of the pork to help me. Okay? The marrow is in there, but Alright, look at this, the little kneecap. Yeah, okay, you don't want that going into your curry. But my god, you want it going in your curry like that. Because someone will eat all that. <laughs> Alright. Uh, the top side is here. That's the two muscles or the two cheeks when they touch. This is called seaming. So I'm going between the muscles. This is the silver side, this is the top side. So I've separated them because of the seam between the muscles. I haven't actually cut the meat. It's just seam. This is the rump and this is the round. Okay? beautiful round muscle. Okay, so I know that you guys are going to be working on that later on. I'm not sure what you're doing with it. Boom, boom. The shoulder. So to do the shoulder, we now have the four quarter ribs. So now we're just going to take this a, a bone in uh, shoulder, we're just going to take off the, the shank. This is known as the four quarter shank. And a little bit ugly. But oh my god, you roast that off. That meat underneath is crap. 
It's just delicious. Delicious. Now we're going to go under the ribs because we want to remove these bones so we can get to the flesh. So I follow the, the ribs around. Underneath here, I try to remove half the spine that was there. So we're slowly exposing the scotch fillet. And I'm not that fussy, I leave a bit of meat on the neck bone because this would make beautiful broth, beautiful anything in so many cultures, especially the Chinese. In Italian, we would chop this up in little pieces and cook it in the tomato sauce to make the most amazing pasta sauce. And then you'd suck all of this meat off the bone. You would pretend that there's no TV camera and you eat with your hands. That's why we eat with our hands. <laughs> but the succulents of something like this is only appreciated when your hands are trying to eat that one. Thank you. No, get out of here. <laughs> so look at that. Look at this amazing muscle. Now I've separated the rib meat from the scotch fillet. I'm looking for the seam. I found that seam. Over here, it's actually attached to the blade bone. So I carve it off. Makes sense? You can buy bone the shoulder from your butcher and he most probably will sell you this. But if you say, no, 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 I want the money muscle in my shoulder, that's the one. Because that is just sweet and succulent. So whenever they refer to something as the money muscle, it's because the Americans, when they cook shoulder, they know that's what you serve the judges. This way you serve the public. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now, <laughs> and to just separate the meat on top of that, this is the hardest butchering bone of the whole body. It's the most ugliest shape. It's the easiest one. At four months in the industry, it was this bone that made me slip and stab my leg. And I had to go to hospital because I, I, popped a, I hit a vein. And uh, when I was uh, only two months in, I got a bone. And the reason being, just like I said before, because it's young, the tendons are all soft and tender. Humorous bone, bone of the shoulder. Nice thick part of the fat, a bigger pig. Very nice. You like that? <laughs> so, what I'm doing, I'm taking off the flesh and any excess fat so I can put that in sausages. 
and now that can become strips of crackle baked off between two uh, your steel mesh to keep it sort of flat and then give pieces to your clients you know with any pork dish all right there we are and when you need large pieces you would just work on this in similar fashion Okay. Wear gloves because they're, they're dangerous and they're also filthy because they grow so much bacteria underneath and if your staff member is just a little bit slack with the way he takes them off, the rest of these just contaminated tape, he just contaminated both his hand with the bacteria that's underneath. And then he goes to the toilet, and he gives he gives he gives the hands a quick wash in there, and then he comes in and doesn't wash his hands. You must wash your hands in the toilet. Then you must wash your hands in here before you start. You get out a steak knife. I just got my little fella, and I'm going pork chop stuff. I understand you have to do some pork chop. Yeah. So. The danger here is that when you don't know it, you could easily hit your hand. So you've got to figure out a way of holding it well away, and then you, you go like that. And the best part where the heaviest hitting is is the back. If you go at the front, it's weak. When you're chopping in this part, it's good and heavy and everything works for you. And, but already, already there's little splinters. You see that that's a splinter bone. You follow? So what I would do is I'd wash this before I cook it. I wouldn't wash it early, I'd wash it late. And while I'm washing it under cold water, I'd be rubbing with my hand to find every little bit. And then I'd pat dry the chop 